Hello, everybody. Um, sorry I couldn't be with you uh, today. I'm uh, away on, on a conference. So I wanted to go ahead and record uh, a, some recitation content. Uh, and this is going to be uh, focused primarily on the homework seven that you have coming up that's due next week. So I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of background about these problems and some tips and a couple commands that might be useful for them. Okay, so <clears throat> the first one, if we look at uh, the first problem, problem number one here, um, this is a problem having to do with data regression. Okay, um, and first of all, we have some data to deal with, and it's in this homework seven data.txt file. Uh, and if you open that in Notepad, uh, let's see, here it is. Um, here in Notepad, you see there are a bunch of different numbers. Uh, and it's just a text file, so this is an ASCII file. Um, and what it says here is in this file, um, it's going to have information about uh, spring data. So the first half of the values in that file are X positions, and the second half are um, force values. So this is um, sort of like the classic physics lab where you have some sort of a spring scale and you measure, you put a certain weight on there so you know what the force is and you measure how much it's displaced. So you know the displacement, you have different data points for how much displacement X you get for a particular force F. And uh, often we're interested in knowing what is the uh, spring constant K. So this problem is about trying to find uh, what the value of the spring constant is for this data. Now, I've given you down here a little bit of, a, uh, of an idea about what your, what your end solution should look like. Okay? And first of all, in here, we have these blue points. And these are the original data. Okay? So those blue points are the things that are actually stored in that data file. And uh, you know when you talk about springs, you have that you know the force is equal to kx, which implies that there's a linear relationship between k and x. Um, but what you find is if you if you uh, stretch a string too far, you end up getting this nonlinear behavior here when the distance gets pulled more than um, you know more than maybe the spring is supposed to be. You get this sort of nonlinear behavior. And so, you know, in the linear region of the spring here, you know, we would identify this green line uh, that essentially gives us the slope of the relationship between the distance and the force, uh, which those distances are, by the way, in inches in the file and pounds force in the uh, in for forces. And so what we're after in this problem is from this, these blue data points to come up with this green line to figure out what the slope is so that we can relate that to our spring constant. Now, you know, a human looking at this data, we can see that, you know, maybe these four points here, you know, don't fall in this straight on line. Okay, and perhaps we shouldn't consider those four points because those are in the nonlinear region of, of the data. So what we would like is for the computer to automatically detect that indeed those four are the four that we don't want to include and we want to draw the line based on all of the others. And we want the computer to be able to automatically make that decision. So how do we work on getting the computer to automatically make a decision like that? Okay, so one thing we know about this that green line is that it's not just any old line, okay, but rather it's a line that goes through the origin that when we have a zero value for x we should get a zero value for f so we should do a line that's not y equals mx plus b but a line that is y is equal to mx plus zero because the y-intercept is zero so basically what we want to do is we want to figure out how to fit a, the best curve the best line okay through the data that goes th that go that also goes through through the origin Okay. Now, uh, we didn't really, we haven't really covered regression or any of this sort of stuff in in the course. Um, but basically, I go through here in the, this these two equations and sort of derive how we find the best slope. But essentially, you know, you don't have to worry about those equations so much. What we're interested in this equation right here, and what that does is f for a given set of x and y values, where in our case x is distance and y is our force, for a given set of n, little n values, 
okay? We need to apply this equation, sum together the product of the x and y values, and sum together the square of all the x values and divide by that. That will tell us what the best fit m is. And essentially, we've gotten here by defining an error measurement, taking the derivative of that error with respect to m, and setting it equal to 0 and solving for this m. So this is the best m that reduces the error as much as possible in that straight line. Okay, so like I said, these two equations you don't have to worry so much about. Okay, um, but this equation is the important one. Given a set of x, y points, we can calculate what the best m is that will uh, fit those points and go through the origin. Now, what we're also going to want to do is to make a decision about how good that fit is. And this value r is the correlation coefficient. And basically, if the value of r is 0, that means that you, you might as well not even do the curve fit, that you know, it, it's, the, the curve fit is not really helping you at all. Okay? And a value of 1 for r is going to give you, uh, you know, the perfect fit, that every point falls exactly on the line. So obviously, we want to get this r as close as we can to 1. Okay? And if it's you know, be significantly below 1, that's not very good. Um, so this part here, this is the equation that you need to calculate r. You need the x and the y values like you needed them previously to get m. The other thing that you have here is y bar, and that's the average y value, so the average force. You take all the forces and take the average one, and, and that's what y bar is. Okay. So what our goal is here is that we're going to look at all of the data to start with. Let me zoom back in here so we can see this graph again. Okay, We're going to take all the data, including all these ones down on the end, and we're going to fit a line through it. Okay, And that line is going to have a lower slope than this one. That, that line is going to sort of go, you know, lean over here to the right a little bit to fit these points more. Okay, And so we're going to calculate a slope for all of the points. We're going to fit a line through it. And we're going to calculate what the value of r is. Now what we're going to do then is we're going to throw away the last point here on the end. So throw away that point and calculate a new line. Okay, And that line is going to have a slightly higher slope because this point is no longer in the, in, you know, being considered. And so we'll calculate a new slope for ignoring that line and calculate the new r. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is it a good idea to get rid of that last point, or should we keep it? Now, obviously, in this case, the human can see, well, you know, that point is not in the linear region, so we want to get rid of it. But what we're going to do is the computer is going to make the decision. OK, well, what was the value of r? How close was r to 1? How good was the curve fit when I included that point? And then I'm going to get rid of that point. I'm going to say, well, how good is the r value? How good is the fit when I put a line through all the points except the last one? So if I get rid of that point and the new curve fit has a better r, an r closer to 1, then I should throw away that last point. Okay. Then once I've thrown away that last point, I'm going to say, well, let's go ahead now and take a curve fit ignoring the second to last point. And if the r increases again, well, let's get rid of that. And then we're going to keep getting rid of a point. So throw that one away, assuming that if I get rid of it, the r gets better. Then I throw that away if r gets better. 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 And eventually, at some point, the r is not going to get better anymore. And if the r is not increasing anymore, that probably means then that we've gotten rid of all of the nonlinear points. So you're going to have some sort of loop that's going to iteratively remove one point and see if the r value gets better. And that loop should stop once that r value stops increasing. And it's at that point that you're going to go ahead and plot the green line that is the curve fit for, uh, for the, for the, that is only for the linear region. Okay? So that's the idea behind the problem. Okay, and one of the things I haven't shown you yet is how to load in values from a da from a data file. Okay, um, so I've already uh, created a file here and saved it in the directory, and I ran that file. Um, I ran that file in the directory where my um, where my file is, and if I do ls here in the Python console, that's um, 
a command in Python to list what's in the directory. And you can see what's one of the files that's in the directory is this homework 07 data.txt. Now, what's really nice is that NumPy has a really handy command for loading in text files. Okay? Uh, so first I'm going to import NumPy as NP. And there's this, this um, there's a, uh, an, a, a, there's a command np dot text no load txt and basically you send to it a string of the file name and it will load those values into the variable here so you can see in my variable explorer I now have a um, a numpy array if I do type type on vowels, okay? It's a num numpy array, and I can also say, well, what is the shape of vowels? Okay, it has 32 elements. Now notice, what is the type of vowels.shape? Okay, that actually is a tuple, and the length of that tuple is one. There's only one uh, one value in that tuple, and that's the 32. So vowels.shape0 is the actual number 32, where vowels itself is a numpy, numpy array, and vowels.shape is a tuple where the first element in the tuple is 32. Because, vowel, because vowels could be, say, a two-dimensional array, and so there might be something that comes after that comma. So if we want to get vowels shape, um, and we want to get the actual number 32, we have to index the first element in that tuple of vowels shape. So I can do this in here, import numpy as mp, and I can say vowels is equal to uh, numpy.loadtxt and then put in the file name homeworkdata.txt. Okay, now, uh, and of course we can print vowels. And we run that. And we see homework 07 data. Gotta have the whole file name in there. That might work. There we go. So here's all the values. You can see there's an ellipse in here because there's a bunch of values. Well, how many values are there? There were 32, right? Okay. And so this data file said that the first half of them were x values. The second half were the um, were the were the y were the force values. Okay. So if I do store in here n is equal to vowels dot shape zero, that's going to be that number 32. And if I divide that by 2, that's going to give me 16. That's the number of x values and the number of y values. So let me, I just want to make sure I get this right while I'm here. Let me go ahead and put down here the n. Um, so my n now is a float. Oh, it's a float that has 16, interesting, rather than an array, that, rather than a uh, integer interesting anyway so I want to extract out of vowels I want to get the first I want to get 0 up through n minus 1 I think yes yeah, so those need to be integers so that's interesting that shape ends up returning an, an array, a, a, a float so we want to convert that into an integer. Okay, you know what? We can just do this in the script. So let's do print vowels zero to n minus one. Okay, let's try. That. I'll see if that works now. That I converted n into an integer. Okay, so that gives me how many things? So let's store. We'll go ahead and store this in x. Now the question is if I got all of them, if I need to go up to 6, because 0 through 15 should be 16 values. 0 through, oh, but that's right. In, in Python, 
that's going to go start at index 0 and do n minus 1 actual values. So if I want all 16 of them, that should give it to me. If I do print x now, that will give me 0 up to 1.5 at increments of 0.1 are 16 values. Then yeah, I want to go x equals, no, f. I need to get the last 16 values. So I want to go from n plus 1. No, I want to go from n to the end. Does that work? Let's see. And we want to print f. Print f. OK. So here are all of our x values, and here seem to be all of our f values. There do appear to be 16 of them. So basically what I did here is I have loaded in all of my values. Okay, I saw how many are there and divide it by 2 because the first half of them are x and the second half are y. Then I indexed, numerically indexed the first half of them and put them in x, and then numerically indexed the last half of them to get in f. Now I've got x and I've got f, and we could go ahead and plot these. If I import matplotlib.pyplot as plot, then we should be able to do uh, plot.figure1. We'll go ahead and clear that in case there's already something there. And then I'll do plot.plot .plot x versus f, and I'll put little asterisks on them. Let's see. We get a plot here that there's our data. Okay, And so that's the data that you will recognize from here. So now we've got all of the data plotted at least. We loaded it in and we plotted it. And now essentially what we need to do is we need to have some sort of loop here to take away the last point. Or well, we have to start with all the First, start with all the points, calculate the m, calculate the r, and then go through a loop. Take away the last point. Calculate a new m and a new r. Okay, Is the new r better than the old r? If so, continue the loop and take away another point. Is the new r better than the old r? If so, make, go and take away another point, etc. And that loop should continue until you remove a point and the r value gets worse, then you know you should probably keep that point rather than getting rid of it. And you should end and go ahead and plot your line uh, on top of your data so that you get something that looks like that line right there. And then the final thing is for you to go ahead and print on the screen what the value of uh, the spring constant is. Because that's the whole point of the problem. We've measured forces versus x's, and we want to go ahead and get what the uh, spring constant is. Okay. All right, so that is problem number one. Okay, so uh, that's the first one. There's three problems. Uh, the second problem is kind of interesting. Um, it's one of these things where, you know, in, in your textbooks, um, I mean, there's lots of times when you read your textbooks and it feels like the author is writing to somebody that already knows the material. You know, you get frustrated. They're like, oh, well, this is left as an exercise to the student, blah, 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 sort of thing. Uh, you know, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Um, and it's really interesting. When I was teaching fluid dynamics, I had a book uh, that made this statement here. It says, the difficulty with its use, that is this equation right here, uh, is that it's implicit in the, dif independent, in the dependence of f. That is, for given conditions, it's not possible to solve for f without some sort of iterative scheme. But of course, with the use of modern computers and calculators, such calculations are not difficult. Well, maybe not for you, but many of us may not have done this before. So um, the idea is indeed that this equation is, cannot be explicitly written as a function of f. Okay, you know, there's an f here, there's also an f here, but we can't rearrange the equation to combine the f's because this f has a square root on it and it's inside a logarithm base 10. Now, you know what? I have not looked yet to figure out what is um, the NumPy uh, logarithm base 10. 
I'm not sure what the command is. I'm it's probably just log 10. Yeah, there it is, log 10. So numpy.log10, that'll allow you to get this log, logarithm base 10. So the whole problem with this equation is that you can't isolate f on one side of the equation to get an explicit equation in f. So you need to use what it suggests here, an iterative scheme to be able to find what f is. Now to show you how you can go about that process, let me show you something here in the console. Let's say that you're trying to solve this equation. x is equal to sine x plus 1. Okay. Now that looks like a pretty easy equation. You should be able to get x all on one side of the equation and find an explicit expression for x. But actually, I'm not sure if it's impossible. Um, but if it is possible, it's very difficult to solve this equation. Okay? And I think it might actually be impossible. Um, so the idea is how do we find what value of x satisfies that equation? Okay? Well, what you can do is you can do a sort of a guess and check situation. So let's say I guess, okay, let me, let me write a comment here. It's a comment. I want to solve x is equal to sine of x plus 1. So let's say I just guess that x is equal to 1, okay? And if I take sine of x and add 1, okay? Well, I need numpy, don't I? Import numpy as in p. And so if I do um, numpy sine of x plus 1. So I set x to equal 1. And then I said, well, what is sine of x plus 1? Okay. And the equation we're trying to solve is that x is equal to sine of x plus 1. Now, if we had guessed x correctly, okay, then plugging x into this equation should give me the same x. So if x indeed satisfied that equation with a value of 1, then I would have gotten a value of 1 when I plugged in to this equation. Because if I plug in x into here, that tell, this equation tells me that I should get x back. But I didn't. I plugged in 1 for x, and I got 1.84147 for x. So x is not equal to 1. That's not the correct answer. Okay, so well, maybe we get something different. Well, what about if I make x equal to 1.5? What is numpy sine of x plus 1? Okay. Oh, well, it's one something different. 1.5 doesn't solve that equation correctly. Okay. So we have to keep, well, let's guess some other x. Okay. And you can keep guessing x's and guessing x's, and maybe eventually you might get the answer, but there's actually a systematic way to go about this. Okay. What we can do is we can guess our x equal to 1. And what we can do now is we can reset x and say, well, let's guess a new x. But let's not just randomly guess any old x. Let's plug x into the equation and find out what the answer is. And let's make that our new guess for x. So right now, x is 1. But if I plug that in, now x has gotten updated to this value. Now, why don't we go ahead and take this value plug it into this equation and find out what x, what get, comes out and let's set that as our new x. So we'll do that again. Well, that's our new x. Well, let's do that again. Let's take that value, plug it in and get a new x. Now you can see we started at x equals 1 here and we got bigger, 1.84. Okay. Then I plugged it in again, it got bigger again, 1.96. Now, I plugged in 1.96, and I got a smaller number. Look at this. So it looks to me now like the actual answer is somewhere in between 1.96 and 1.92. I mean, we're getting close. We plugged in 1.96 and we into here. We didn't get 1.96 back, but we're close. So the answer must be close to 1.96, and I guess it falls somewhere in between here. So what we can do is we can keep doing this over and over again. Keep doing this. So every time I'm hitting enter here, I'm calculating a new x with the old x. And I keep doing this over and over again. And well, what's that x? Now let's see. Let's do the next time. What is that x? And you can see here, hey, look, I plugged this number into the equation, and I got nearly the same number back. I mean, it differs in what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, it differs in the 15th decimal place. So that's pretty darn accurate. So this x is pretty close to satisfying this problem. Okay? So this is really great. Okay? 
all we did is we started off with a guess. I mean, let me guess x equals negative 1. What happens then? x equals, you know, what's the new x? It's that. Let's get another x. What's the x? Let's get another x. It's that. And so you can see here, no matter what x we start with, we started with x1 the first time. Here we started with the x equal negative 1, and it still converged to the same answer. So you don't even have to have a very good first guess, and most of these equations will converge on the right answer. So if we were to do this in, our mat, in, in uh, Python, we would do some sort of a while loop. Okay. So we do something like, let's, uh, we still do need the numpy. So we need to import numpy as np. And let's set x equal to 1. And let's have a while loop. And for right now, I'll just have it always run. That's an infinite loop. And let's recalculate. x is equal to x plus numpy dot sine of x plus 1. And let's just go ahead and print x in this infinite loop. So here we go. It's running over and over again and see it, it ends up converging on that point 1.9345. Okay? Yeah, you know, let's guess something else. I don't know. Let's guess 100. What happens if we guess 100? Boom, converges on the same value. Isn't that cool? Okay? So obviously, we're going to have to have some way of stopping this other than just having it be an infinite loop. Um, and one, I don't know, you could do it a hundred times, but I don't know, maybe a hundred isn't enough. Um, I guess what you could do is you could calculate, you know, check to see how much different is the right hand side of the equation to the left hand side of the equation. And if the left and right hand sides of the equations are very close to each other, maybe the same to 10 decimal places or something, then we can go ahead and stop the while loop. So you'll have to have some sort of you know, stopping criteria that once x stops changing very much from one iteration to the next, you'll want to go ahead and stop your while loop. Okay? So this strategy, this sort of guess and check, you know, guess the value and plug the new value in, it works for most of these implicit equations, and it will also work for the implicit equation that is here in the homework problem. Okay? So in this homework problem, it's a fluid mechanics problem. So actually, you're, you're very likely to see this equation when you get the fluid mechanics. Um, oftentimes, we solve this in a table rather than using uh, this equation. Um, but who knows? Maybe you can, uh, you can impress your fluids teacher when you get to fluids. Um, but a lot of times, we're interested in how much the pressure changes, the change in pressure um, when you're flowing through a pipe. And so L is the length of the pipe, D is the diameter of the pipe, rho is the density of the fluid flowing through the pipe, and V is the speed of the fluid flowing through the pipe. Now in this problem, I've gone ahead and given you uh, the value for the length, the diameter, the density, and also the viscosity mu. That's, that shows up here in the, in the equation for F. So I've given you all these values. The one thing that you, that you don't yet see is the value for the speed. And what I want you to do is calculate the value for the change in pressure at lots of different speeds between 50 and 100 meters per second. Okay? And so basically what you're going to produce is a graph where on the x-axis you have speed, okay? and on the y-axis you have the pressure drop. So you're going to have to have some loop to loop through all of your different speeds, starting at 50 and ending at 100 meters per second. So for any one of those given speeds, let's say we think about the 50 meters per second, you will have 50 in there for the speed. The rho, the d, and the mu are all given. And you're going to guess some value for f. Okay? You're going to plug that value of f and the other constants into this equation to get a new value for f. Then you'll plug that new value in for f, calculate it again. You're going to keep getting new values for f over and over again, just like we did for x in the example. And once f stops changing very much from iteration to iteration, you'll go ahead and stop your loop. And that will tell you what the value of f is, in this case, for 50 meters per second. You take that value of f, you'll plug it in here with the other things, including that 50 uh, meters per second for v, to calculate a pressure drop. Okay, it's going to be it's uh, that's how much the pressure drops flowing through the pipe.
And so that will give you one data point in your graph. Remember, the vertical axis is going to be delta P, and the horizontal axis is going to be V. So at V equals 50 feet meters per second, you're going to have your delta P. Then you're going to have to calculate the next value of V. Maybe you do 51 meters per second or 55 meters per second. So you have some loop to loop through V. So now I have a new value, say 55 meters per second. Plug in a new V. I'm going to go through that while loop again. Use that at, you know, use your original guess for F, calculate a new F, go around and around and around and around. And get a new value for F for 55 meters per second. Get a new delta P. That'll give you your second data point. Okay, so basically the structure of this program is going to be a nested loop. You'll have an outside loop that's going to loop through the values of V from 50 up to 100. Then we'll have an inner loop that's going to loop, uh, uh, loop like we did here. So our inner loop is going to be something like this to get us figure out what the best F value is. And then the outer loop is going to cycle through different values of the speed between 50 and 100 meters per second. Okay, you'll want to double check and make sure all the units work out. We got some things in kilograms, something in centimeters, meters, newtons, etc., and meters per second for the speed. So you want to make sure that your units check out. Okay. All right. So those are the first two problems. Um, the third problem is actually pretty straightforward. Um, it's you want to do a surface plot with this equation. Okay, and we want to use this black shaped domain. So you're going to have to go through, uh, you need to create a mesh grid for your x's and y's. And then you're going to want to uh, also uh, get yourself uh, your z uh, matrix. And then you're going to want to cut this out by setting those to be um, not a numbers, like we did in class last time. We did that with a 1D plot, but it works the same. Kind of like where you cut out the middle of the, of the um, beam in that strength of materials problem in a MATLAB homework. And so this is a semicircle. It's a semicircle with radius uh, 2. And so anything that is has a y value less than the square root of 2 squared minus x squared, that's going to give you this region that you want to cut out. Okay, So anything where y is less than that value is inside this semicircle and should get set to not a number. And then you can do a surface plot like, like we did in, in class last time. Okay, So those are the three problems. Uh, we got this regression problem here where the computer is automatically determining where the linear part of the graph is. Uh, then we have this guy, which is sort of a little um, you know, numerical solution for an implicit equation. And then the last one is doing a surface plot uh, using matplotlib. Okay, And all three of them are going to create graphs. The first two are 2D graphs, and the last one, of course, is 3D. So that's sort of a breakdown of, of the homework. Uh, again, here I'll show you uh, in a sort of some, a basis uh, for the first problem here. We've got where we're, we're loading in our data file and sort of splitting that data up into X's and F's. And then this is sort of an example problem solving a little bit simpler implicit equation, um, but basically does the same thing as what you need to solve that implicit equation for F in the homework too. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut that, uh, cut this off here. Um, I'll upload this onto the YouTube so you guys can have a look uh, instead of going to class uh, tomorrow. Okay, uh, I will see you. I'll be gone all of this week. Um, I'll be back on Monday. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me and I'll be available um, by email to be able to answer questions this week if you have uh, some issues with the homework. Okay.